I'm going to invite you to take your Bible now and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1. And uh, just share with you this morning uh, a little bit of introduction. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke about Hanukkah here, and that was appropriate. Hanukkah also called the Feast of Dedication. And then we noted that Hanukkah has also been called the Feast of Lights. So I want to talk to you this morning about when the light shined in the darkness. Now, I ask you to take your Bible, look at John chapter 1, and look at verse 5. We'll read verse 5. Eventually, we're going to look at verses 1 to 14. But to begin with, let's just look at verse 5. John chapter 1 and verse 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for it being so clear and plain, easy to understand. Thank you for giving it to us. Lord, we pray that you will send your sweet and blessed Holy Spirit today to be our teacher and our guide, to guide us into all truth, to help us in our understanding, and Lord, to speak to our hearts exactly the message that you would have in this hour. Thank you for all that's transpired so far in this service, the people who are here and the, the music that we've had and all of it. Lord, now let us focus upon your word. And cause us, Lord, to be attentive. Cause us to be changed by that which we see from your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're talking about light this morning. There are different things types of light and different types of darkness. Merriam-Webster's dictionary gives us some help on this. Um, if you look light up in the dictionary, you're going to find multiple definitions, and I'm not going to try to give you all of them. It would take too long. But here are just eight of the many uses of the word. Number one, something that makes vision possible. If you don't have light, you, you can't see anything. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation of total darkness where there's absolutely no light. I have a couple of times, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's a strange feeling. It, it really is. When you cannot see anything, uh, if you touched your palm to your nose, you couldn't see your fingers. I mean, there is no light. You can't see anything at all. So light is something that makes vision possible. Number two, it is electromagnetic ra radiation of any wavelength, and that's true. And we talk about the speed of light. Uh, somebody was talking to me the other day about uh, would we travel to other universes. Well, first of all, I'm not totally convinced there are other universes. There are other galaxies, but that's all part of the same universe. But I said, no, I don't think so. And they said, why? Well, the next nearest galaxy, if I, if I remember, I just read this the other day, I think is 190 light years away. What that means is you'd have to travel at 186,000 miles per second for 190 years to get there. I don't think anybody's going to do that, folks. <laughs> I really don't, uh, just because you couldn't live long enough to do it. Now, what if it didn't take that long? What if it only took 150 years to get there? Well, you still, would you live long enough to get there? No, probably not. So are there other galaxies? Of course. And are there stars and planets out there? Uh, but I think some of them, many of them, most of them probably are beyond our reach. Now, I talked to this person. I said, well, they said, do you think we'll ever go to other planets here? I said, yeah, I think so. Don't know that, but uh, it looks likely. But think about it. One of the nearest planets to ours is the planet Mars. And we've already put several spacecraft on Mars. But do you know that to get from here to the planet Mars takes six months? Now, you're going to take six months to get there and then it would take six months to get back, so that's one year. And then how long are you going to stay when you're there? Are you going to go up and, and spend the day and come back? I, I wouldn't think so. So it's been estimated that it would be a minimum of a two-year mission just to send somebody to Mars and get them back. So is that going to happen? I, I'm certainly not going to stand here and tell you it won't happen. I think there's a good possibility it will. But we talk about light. And light is electromagnetic radiation, magnetic radiation of any wavelength. 
And then there's another use of the word light. Number three is to set fire to something. You know, you're going to light the fire. Uh, number four is to illuminate a path or area. That's a lighted path that you're, you're going down or a lighted street. And then the word light can, mean you, uh, can be used to mean to weigh less or to cause to weigh less. So we're going to lighten the load. Or to reduce the intensity of color that's not as dark as, that, uh, as it was before. Uh, we've lightened the color. Or to make something clear or to soften it. But the number eight definition, and this is the one I want you to think about this morning, the eighth definition of light is truth. Truth. That's what we just read about in John chapter 1, verse 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Actually, I think all of these definitions are incorporated in what we're going to read here in John chapter 1, but the eighth one, truth, is the primary one that I find in this chapter. Now, all of the Bible is the inspired word of God. What does that mean? It means God inspired men to write the book. Uh, a man said to me on one occasion, he said, well, the Bible was written by men. And I said, yes, it was written by Israeli men. A lot of people don't stop and think about that, but that's a fact. And he, he kind of seemed taken aback by that. He, I suppose, wasn't aware of that fact. But it's true. But where did the men get the words? Well, they just made them up. Well, if they did, they're pretty incredible writers because you have all of these different books of the Bible, 66 of them in our English Bible, that were written over a period of centuries, and they all harmonized perfectly together. That's quite an accomplishment for 40 or more different writers to do over that period of time. No, the Bible is the inspired word of God. God gave the men the words to write, told them what to write, and they wrote them. But there are some chapters of the Bible, and I'm saying all of the Bible is God's word, and it's all worthy of our time and reading. And uh, now is probably a good time to say to you, a lot of folks, and, and not everybody does this, of course, but a lot of folks try to read through the Bible in a year. And you can do that. Many people have done it. It's very possible to do. Uh, how, how do you do that? Well, you get a schedule and you schedule yourself or you say, well, I don't know how to make the schedule. Well, if you use a computer, you go online and look up a schedule for how to read the Bible through in a year and you'll find many of them out there. Some of them combine reading a uh, few chapters, the Old Testament with a few chapters, of the New Testament, and, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or if you just want to start in Genesis and read through to the end of the Revelation, all you have to do is read four chapters a day, and you'll do it. Read four chapters every day, and you'll get there. Now, some chapters are longer, and some are shorter. Uh, you'll find some of them are very short. Some books are only one chapter long. But you read four chapters a day, and you'll read through the Bible in one year. You'll do it. And uh, it's been done many times. I taught through the entire Bible. Uh, it took me about 20 years to do that. And Having said that, that doesn't mean that I know everything there is in there or that I've taught everything there is in there. It means that I've gone through every chapter of the Bible. But that, again, took about 20 years. But there's some chapters that are worth coming back to over and over and over. And the first chapter of John is one of those. And we can come back to it and we can read that chapter that we've read before and we get something new from it. So I want you to consider with me this morning the light that shined in the darkness. Look at the first two verses. It says, in the beginning, John 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning. What beginning is that? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you have to stop and ask yourself, the beginning of what? Well, the Hebrew indicates that this is the absolute beginning. It is the first of its kind. It is the beginning of all beginnings. That is to say, the beginning of everything. It was at a time when there was no time. It was in a place where there was no place as we understand it. When all that existed was God, and there was no one and nothing else. So I, I don't get that, preacher. I don't understand. Well, I'm not sure. I totally understand it. I accept it. 
Well, how can you accept something like that? Well, we have to have a beginning point somewhere, don't we? And so I'm willing to accept this because it makes perfect sense. So before there was time, before there were galaxies and stars and planets as we've talked about, before there was a universe, before anything and everything that our finite minds can imagine, there was God. And God did something. God created the heaven and the earth. Created, the word means shaped, formed, fashioned, uh, like a person would take a, a lump of clay and mold it. In the Latin, it says he created ex nihilo. That means out of nothing. God created the heaven and the earth. This planet and its atmosphere were born. In the second verse of Genesis 1, it says, And the earth was without form and void. That means, as we said before, like a lump of clay that needs to be molded and shaped. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. So we know that there was an ocean there. We know there was water there. And darkness covered the face of the deep. And then it says the Spirit of God hovered or moved over the face of the waters. That's a very important concept to understand. The Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters, or again, literally hovered over the face of the waters. Apparently, the earth was not a spirit first. It was perhaps a lump, like the clay in a potter's hand. But there was water, and there was depth to the sea that was. And there was darkness. And God said, God spoke, God commanded, let there be light. And light in every sense of the word, such as the ability to see the light of day, dawn, morning, lightning, the light of a lamp or other sources, the light of life, the light of prosperity, the light of instruction, the light of wisdom, the light of illumination, the light of Jehovah, the Savior. Let there be light. And there was light. Light entered into the world at the sound of God's voice, at the speaking of his commandment. God's word was given and light came. Now hold on to that concept. because We're going to come back to it. In the fourth verse of Genesis 1, it says, And God saw the light, that it was good. It was as God intended, to, intended it to be. There was nothing contaminated. It was pure and clean. And God divided or separated the light from the darkness. Darkness, as we know, the definition of darkness is really the absence of light. It is where there is no light. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The beginning. Well, that's nice, preacher, but what does that have to do with Gospel of John chapter 1, which was written many many centuries later well it starts with the same words in the beginning well what beginning is this speaking about the same beginning the same beginning as in Genesis 1 1 the beginning of everything that we know and relate to the beginning of creation the beginning that Moses wrote about the absolute beginning the first of its kind it says, in the beginning was the word, the first cause, the declaration and commandment of God, the truth. Note that it does not say in the beginning was a word. It doesn't say a word. It says in the beginning was the word. This is a particular statement that's made. This is a particular word that was spoken. This particular word that existed. And notice something else in verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. The word was with God. If you'll notice the verse, you'll notice that the word is capitalized there. The reason it's capitalized is it's not just a noun, it is a pronoun. It represents a living being. So in the beginning was the word, the living word, and the word was with God. Oh, so here was God and here was the word. Wait, look at the next statement. And the word was God. 
There's a grammatical equivalence here. In verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. The word was God, coexisting with God. As Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 5, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And as Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. So in verse 2, it says the same was in the beginning with God. The word in verse 1, the same, not another, the same word was with God, Theos, translated Elohim and Jehovah together. Elohim, the one who is God, who is many but one, and Jehovah, the one who is the Savior of mankind. And then in verse 3, it says, all things were made by him. All things were made by who? Well, we, we read the creation story it said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and here we're told in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God and so in verse 3 it says all things were made by him all things were made by the word you said God created ex nihilo out of nothing how did he create well he spoke things into existence he commanded and it appeared. It happened. Well, preacher, I'm not sure I can buy that. Okay. So what's the other explanation for what happened? I, I'm going to tell you there, there are others. And this isn't the only one. But one of the other prominent explanations for the beginning of everything is this. That before there was time, there was gas. Now, we're not told where the gas came from. But there was gas. And the gas, without any physical forces being present yet, began to swirl. And somehow, centrifugal force came into play, and the gas, as it swirled, compacted. As it compacted, it compacted into a tight ball. And the pressure of that compaction was so enormous that it exploded. And there was the universe. Folks, I like the Bible explanation better. That we have an intelligent designer and not just one great cosmic accident. That you and I are here by design and we are not accidents. We didn't just happen. We're here with a purpose. And we live our life on purpose. So again in verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This is the one who's the word. And in verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is the source of light, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord, Jehovah, God, Elohim, Formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then that brings us back to verse 5, where we began this morning. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So in verse 3, he is the source of life, but in verse 4, he is the source of light. In verse 5, the source of light. The light of the truth of God in bodily form entered into the sin-darkened world, the dark night in which lost mankind stumbles day after day. We have problems in the world. Can I share a news flash with you? The world's always had problems. Oh, not like today. Well, if you study history, you're going to find that there have been periods very much like today. You're saying you don't think we're near the end? I'm not saying that. I'm saying the things that we're experiencing, people have experienced similar things before. That's what I'm saying. You go back through history, you'll understand that. So we need light 
And we need light so that we can see and so that we can understand and so that we can comprehend. But look at what it says. The light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness of secrecy, the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of rebellion, the darkness of moral depravity, the darkness did not comprehend the light. The darkness could not understand the light, could not relate to the light. The darkness could not grasp, could not connect with the light. As Jesus himself would later say, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John chapter 3 verse 9. Verses 6 through 8 tells about a different person. In verse 6 it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now this, this is a man, he's a human being like other men. So when it says he was sent from God, doesn't mean that he was an angel who came down from heaven or anything of that sort. If we go to Luke chapter 1, we read about the birth of this man. And he was born by natural means. But he was sent on a mission for God. He had a life's purpose. And you have a life's purpose. Yours would not be the same as his, but you have one. You have a reason for existing. You have a reason for living. You have value to your existence. And this man's name was John, very common name. John. What was his mission? Well, verse 7 says, the same came for a witness. Now, what is a witness? A witness is someone who testifies to that which he or she knows. That which they know to be true because they were there and experienced things or they saw things. Uh, I've read something the other day and somebody said do you have any proof of what happened and the response was we have the best proof we could have an eyewitness well that is good proof isn't it I was there when it happened I saw what happened I heard what happened I experienced it I can tell you all about it the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light notice light is capitalized there again referring to a person not just a concept or an entity but a person the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe so the light shined in the darkness the light of the truth of God in bodily form the light that guides us the darkness does not comprehend it but John comes as a witness of the light and his goal was that all men would come to believe now this is not the John who writes this book that we call the gospel of John two different Johns John was a common name in those days just as it is today how many of you know anybody named John raise your hand Okay, put your hands down. How many of you know more than one person named John? Okay, yeah, pretty much all of us do. It was the same way then. So we're talking about two different men with the same name. This one we would call John the Baptist. The fellow who wrote the book here is called John the Apostle. They were of different ages. They were born in different cities at different times. They had different missions, and yet, in a sense, they had the same mission. John the Baptist came as a witness of the light, and John the Apostle records all of this for us. And he too was a witness. With firsthand knowledge to testify what he knew to be absolutely true. But in verse 8, John the Apostle is very careful to tell us that John the Baptist was not that light. He's not the light. He's not the light who came into the world. He was a messenger. He was sent to prepare the way for the light that was to come. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9 says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What a tremendous statement. 
the true light which lighteth every man, makes it possible for every man to see. Well, preacher, there are people born not able to see, and that's true. But we're not speaking only about physical sight here. We're speaking about the being able to see and understand and know truth. And this one who was the light came and he even gave the light of vision to many people. I'd encourage you to read Gospel of Luke chapter 4 for more information on that. It'll help your understanding tremendously. This was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Does every person then have a revelation of God? Yes. The French philosopher and scientist Blaise Pascal said this. He said, inside every human being is a vacuum that only God can fill. There's truth to that. We all know that there's something that exists that is greater than we are. We all know that there's something greater than mankind together. What we must, must do is find the one who can fill that gap, who can fill that vacuum. <coughs> the ultimate revelation of God is found in Jesus Christ. When I was a little boy, went to Sunday school, I did not know God at that time. I didn't know much about God. I believed there was a God. But I didn't know God. I didn't know how to know God. And I remember going to Sunday school. That uh, There was a church within walking distance of the house where we lived at the time. And uh, I suppose it was not more than a block away and, and probably not even that far. So we would walk over there go to Sunday school and they gave us a little book I remember it so well about that size and it was yellow cover paperback little booklet and the title of it was the title of it was do you want to know God I thought yeah I'd like to know God and so they used that little book to teach us for a quarter in Sunday school or three months and what the little booklet said was, if you want to know God, get to know Jesus. Because when you get to know Jesus, then you know God. That's exactly right. That's exactly the truth. So if you want to know God, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. Get to know Jesus Christ, and then you get to know God. Look at verse 9 again. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He, the light, was in the world, and the world was made by him. He's the creator. Watch the next phrase. And the world knew him not. There's a song uh, that you may have heard. I, I don't think I've heard it this year. Uh, you usually hear it around this time of year called Sweet Little Jesus Boy. Anybody know that song? You know what it says? We didn't know who you were. That's exactly what it says right here. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. A, a young man asked me a few years ago, said, if this God of yours is real, why doesn't he come to earth and show himself? And I said to the young man, he did. And he thought a moment, and he said, you're talking about Jesus. I said, yes, I am. He did come to the earth and show himself. He was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And as sad as that is, as sad as it is that the creator of all things was in this world, the revelation of Elohim, the God who is many but one, was here. Jehovah, the Lord God himself, was in the world. Some of the saddest words ever written are these, and the world knew him not. He was here. But even the very light of life in the presence of him who is the word, they didn't see him for who he was. They didn't acknowledge him for who he is. 
The light shined in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. That's not the end of the story. Thank God it isn't. The next phrase says, he came unto his own. What does that mean? It means he came to his own people. He came through the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He came through the house and lineage of David. He came to the tribe of Judah. He came to his own people. Preacher, are you saying Jesus was Jewish? That's exactly what I'm saying. There's no question about it. He came to the people of Israel. The Lord spoke to King Solomon when the first temple was dedicated, and he said this, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. God's people, the people of Israel. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Judea. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth under Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he, Joseph, was of the house and lineage of David. And so it says that the light came to his own. In Matthew 13, 54 to 58, we have a perfect illustration of this. It says of Jesus, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch as they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many works there, many mighty works there, because of their unbelief. I'll call your attention back to verse 7, referring to John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. That's the key to it all, believe. Believe. Brings us to verse 12. Quote this verse here often because of the great truth that's in it. But look at verse 12. But, it's an amazing thing. You read through the Bible and that little word, B U T, has such significance. You come to the book of Romans, for example, in chapter 5, and it says, uh, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But then you go to chapter 6 and it says this. For the wages of sin is death. But, but, the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't it amazing? God gives us that little word, but. And we come back. To verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, there were those who did receive him. And as many as received him, to them gave he power. Now, there are different kinds of power. There's energy, but there's also the power of authority. And that's the power that's meant here. As many as received him, to them gave he the, the authority the power to become the sons of God. Isn't that something? To be granted the authority to become a child of God? Well, it's almost as if we were being adopted into God's family, isn't it? And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. 
We can be adopted into the family of God. Now, how do we do that? A man spoke here years ago in, from Miami, and he had a ministry there. He was helping people who wanted to adopt children and children that had been put up for adoption. And he worked with the families and both sides, and he helped people get together and helped them to be able to adopt children. It's a wonderful ministry. We can be adopted into God's family. How do I do that? Well, it took a great deal of paperwork in this man's ministry that he had to help a couple be able to adopt a child. But the process here is far simpler than that. Look at verse 12 again. As many as received him, but as many as received him. What does it mean to receive him? It means to acknowledge him, to believe him, to accept him for who he is. To put your faith and trust in him. As many as received him, to them gave he the power, the authority to do what? To become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you ever stop and wonder, what is it that God wants from you? Uh, here I am living my life and and. Maybe you're early in your life. Maybe you're in the middle of life. Maybe you're towards the end. But we're all here living our lives. Do you ever wonder what's it all about? Do you ever wonder what does God have for me and how can I know? I'll tell you what God wants from you. It's not your money. I thought you preachers were all about money. Well, no. It's not what it's about. But it isn't really what we preachers are about that counts. It's what is God about? What he wants from you is not your money. What he wants from you is your belief. What he wants from you is your faith. Do you know the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God? You can't do it without faith. He wants you to believe him. He wants you to put your trust in him. He wants you to commit yourself to him by faith. So again, it says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, the children of God, even to them that do what? That believe on his name. And then in verse 13, it says, which were born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of physical birth, not of the will of man, not something that mankind wanted to do or, or invented or contrived. But of God. As Jesus would say to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. You hear that phrase these days. People talk about, are you a born-again Christian? And some people say yes, and some people say no. And President Ronald Reagan was asked that question. Somebody asked him, said, sir, are you a born-again man? His answer was this. He said, we don't use that term in my church. That's sad. That's sad that they don't use that term in that church. Because Jesus used that term. Peter used that term. It's a very biblical term to use. And what does it mean? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, physical birth. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit, spiritual birth. And so, we find that the light came into the world. And the world did not comprehend because the world was in darkness and like the darkness. But the light comes so that we can have a new birth, so that we can have a spiritual birth. Everybody present here this morning and everybody listening today has had a physical birth. There's no question about that. If not, we wouldn't be looking at you. But you must have a spiritual birth. I learned this as, as a very young man. 
if you are born only once, you will die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll only die once. We must be born again. We must have the new birth. We must be born of the Spirit. The hymn writer says, born of the Spirit with life from above, into his family divine. So in verse 14, and we'll conclude there. It says, in the word, that same word, the word that was with God, the word that was God, the creator of the universe, and the word became flesh. God became flesh. And he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 7 and 8. And again, Colossians 2, 5. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's an important statement. Such an important statement. Because... Some people will say to you, and I've had people say it to me, well, you believe in the Trinity. I do. Well, you know that word Trinity is not in the Bible. I, I did know that. You read the Bible cover to cover, you'll never find the word Trinity in it. But a lot of terms that we use that you don't find in the Bible doesn't mean the concept isn't there. It just means that word isn't there. For example, the rapture. We talk about the rapture. You read your Bible through, you won't find the word rapture there. But you find the the concept of the rapture there where do you find it many places well give me a couple okay let's let's do john 14 first corinthians 15 and second thessalonians chapter 2 first thessalonians chapter 4 that's just a few you can go to revelation chapter 4 you can go to others the truth of the matter is the concept is there and while the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible, there's another word that does, and I just read it to you a moment ago. Let me give it to you again. Colossians 2, 5, For in him, in Jesus Christ, dwells, lives, all the fullness of the Godhead. That word Godhead is the same concept as Trinity. That's the Bible word for the Trinity. So if you were looking for it, you just found it. Colossians 2 5. In Jesus Christ lives all the fullness of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form, bodily. And so it says in verse 14 And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, lived among us. And John says, And we beheld his glory. We heard about his glory, sung about uh, just a little bit ago. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Same writer, John says, that which we have seen, which we have heard, which our hands have handled of the word of life. You know what he's saying? He's saying he was here. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. He wasn't an imaginary character. He wasn't a myth. He wasn't a legend. He was here. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. We ate with him. We walked with him. We slept with him. We lived with him. He was here. In John eight twelve. Jesus said unto them again, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And in John 14, verses 6 through 9, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, this time forward, you know him and you have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. I, I, I love that. You know what Philip's saying? I want to see God. Can you show me God? I want to see God. Listen to the answer. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet 
Hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Philip, don't you know me? Don't you know who I am? You've seen me. You've seen God. That's why it says, Jesus himself said, God so loved the world, that's you and I, that he gave his only begotten son to none other like him. That whosoever, anybody who would believe in him should not perish, will not experience eternal death, but will have everlasting life. So the question then becomes, have you received him? Have you believed in him? Have you come to that point in your life? If you haven't, the great news is you can. And there's no better time than right now to do that. You open your heart and you call on him and you put your faith and trust in him and you do it today. Now, if you have received him and believed in him, are you like John, a witness, so that others can believe in him? And if you haven't, will you right now put your faith and trust in the light that shined in the darkness, in the one in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. It's the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Will you trust him? Jesus came, as we sang earlier, born to die. He came to pay for our sins at the cross. He died for my sin, for yours. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. And he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. And he said, he that believes on me has everlasting life. He didn't say he that joins the church. He didn't say he that goes through a ritual. He didn't say he that lives the best life he can. He said, he that believes on me has everlasting life. Will you receive him? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can come to you and call you our Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you for the light that shined in the darkness. Lord, at this Christmas time, this time of year, we take time out to celebrate the Savior who came. We're thankful for the baby in the manger, but we're thankful for the man who went to the cross. And for the one who rose from the dead as a guarantee of forgiveness and eternal life. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want to ask you a couple of questions very quickly, and we're finished this morning. Number one. When the day comes that you take your last breath, you close your eyes for the final time. And you come to stand before the creator and king of the universe. If he were to say to you, why should I allow you to live in my heaven? What would you be able to say to him? Would you, be, would you say, well, I've, I've tried the best I could? Or would you be able to say, I realize that like every other human being, I have sinned, I have violated the word of God, I have violated the will of God, and I'm guilty. But I also realize that the light has shined in the darkness that the Savior came 
And on the cross, he paid for my sin. All of it. And he told me to trust him, to forgive me, to save my soul, and to give me everlasting life. And I have. And that's why I'm here. I believe God would say to you, enter into the joy of thy Lord. But if you're not sure about that, you say, well, preacher, that sounds good to me, but I, I, I don't, don't honestly know that I totally understand it. Friend, I've been exactly where you are. I was in that same place. It sounded good to me, but I didn't really understand. Somebody sat down, sat down and, and took a Bible and carefully in, in just a moment or two showed me what the Bible had to say about how to trust Jesus to forgive my sins, to save my soul, and give me everlasting life. And I would like to do that for you. If you'd just give me the opportunity. Not asking for a lot of your time. We're talking about a matter of minutes. Just to take time and show you what the Bible has to say. And then you make your own decision. It's that simple. So we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If you're here in person or you're listening online and you say, well, I'd, I'd like to know how to be saved, would you please give me the opportunity to take the Bible one-on-one, -on -one, show you what it has to say so that you can trust Jesus as your Savior. Well, preacher, I'm not sure I can do that. Well, then do this right where you sit. Open your heart and call on him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him and say, Lord, I don't know all about it. I don't understand everything, but I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you paid for my sin at the cross. And I'm trusting you to forgive me. I believe you're alive today. I'm trusting you to save me. And I'm trusting you to give me a home with you forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer. Maybe you didn't. You still can. It's not essential that you have those exact words. God knows your heart. He knows what you mean. You call on him and ask him to forgive you and save you, and he will. He's promised to do it. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Preacher, if I needed to, I could tell you the time. I could show you the place where the Lord saved me. That's wonderful. Has God spoken to you in another way? Maybe nothing we've said this morning, but you know the Lord has spoken to your heart. What is it that the Lord would have you to do? What is that decision that you need to make? There's no better time than the present. Will you make that decision right now? Father, bless and move this invitation time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.